life histories, the various choices organisms make in evolutionary time to optimize their reproduction over their entire lifespan. So I say choices, but this isn't so much a conscious thing, like I want more fitness, it's just those organisms that have the most offspring early on may not be able to have more offspring later on. So these kind of life history choices are not made so much as a conscious decision, but evolution optimizing a certain organism and an organism optimizing itself through the selection of things that are suboptimal to have, well, less fitness. So that's pretty much how evolution and natural selection can change life history traits. Let's go through the principle of allocation. Uh, we'll go for more examples and then maybe even a few more examples and use that principle of allocation to explain different investments in survival, reproduction, and growth, as well as investments in offspring size, offspring quality, and additional investments in offsprings. <coughs> Last, be able to compare life history strategies. So let's start off with the idea of various trade-offs in life history traits. What is there to trade? Now, we'd all want to find an organism that has a, a very young age of sexual maturity, is very large, uh, and has many offspring produced per cycle of reproduction, uh, reproduces every day, uh, is able to invest a ton of parental care, and lives for a thousand years. But clearly, that got more ridiculous the further on I went. If I say that an organism is very young when it's sexually mature, and then I turn around and say it's also very large, what you're thinking of is some organism that's going to grow, you know, like a balloon, and then be able to reproduce within a year. And that's probably something that's going to trade off. The number of reproduction of offspring produced per unit reproduction versus the number of reproductive cycles, well, you think about that and you think, well, let's see if you produce a lot of offspring many times, or a lot of offspring a few times, or a few offspring many times, you start seeing that semel parity to itero parity kind of trade-off, as we've discussed before, and we'll uh, go over again at the end of this lecture and as well as parental care and longevity. So longer spent in parental care means a longer lifespan, actually. So that's not so much a trade-off, but it does take down the number of reproductive cycles. If this chimpanzee is taking care of one offspring, it's harder to take care of another. And this comes down to that principle of allocation. Now, with a bigger board, what I could do is I could make that kind of trident feature with a, make a spike with a, a large trunk leading into six branches. So kind of a double trident? I don't know. And what happens is the energy has to be expended in one trait, but it can't be used for another. The size of the adult versus the amount of parental care. Now, this might be something that is going to be um, a trade-off. So less parental care could lead to... Um, well, larger adult, because that adult is now more able to feed themselves. So these are kind of trade-offs that we will see, and we'll see how this, uh, this different allocation becomes more optimal, because optimality theory will apply. The amount of energy per unit time is being here invested in offspring. So you're thinking of it in terms of fitness. What is the most fitness per unit time? Now, if this merganser, the, the duck-like thing, has a large number of offspring, that's good fitness, but each one of those eggs will have to be smaller. So the chance of survivorship for each one of those offspring goes down. So let's say a merganser has five small eggs. It's gonna make five small um, merganslings, <laughs> chicks. It's gonna make five small chicks. And out of those five small chicks, each one of them is gonna stand maybe a um, an eight in 10 chance of survival. Okay, so one of, one of Four or five, four to five chance of survival. Well, that means one of them is probably going to draw the short straw. You end up with four chicks. But let's say there's a merganser who makes four medium eggs. Now, each one of those has a slightly better chance of survival, maybe nine out of ten. So sometimes there will be four, and sometimes there will be five that survive. Let's say a merganser now has um, three large eggs. Well, that'll make three large chicks, each of which has a 99% of survival. So they're probably going to be three. So you see how five chicks with a four out of five chance in survival will probably end up with four chicks. Four chicks with a 90% chance of survival are probably going to end up with four, but sometimes five chicks. And three chicks with an 100% chance of survival, or as close to, are going to always end up with three chicks. So 
you start ending with that, well, which one's going to produce the most? Well, the four chicks is going to produce the most. So four eggs producing four medium-sized chicks will produce a better outcome per unit time than five small chicks or three large chicks. And that is the idea of optimality theory. So certain traits are going to be more or less successful than others. This isn't the organism choosing how many chicks to have. This could be genetically encoded. And if it weren't genetically encoded, those mergansers that are capable of having four medium eggs are going to send more genes to the next generation. And that is how the evolution of this optimality is, uh, evolution of this, these trade-offs are going to be more optimal. Now we can go through the same example with, I guess, lemmings, sugar gliders, I'm not quite sure what those little cute things are, like Pikachu or something, or wolves. But this is going to apply in every type of organism. There's an optimal number of offspring. The optimal number of offspring per reproductive cycle really depends on what the chances are of those organisms surviving to adulthood. Fewer organisms per reproductive cycle means a greater chance of surviving, but it also means fewer organisms per reproductive cycle. So let's go through some different trade-offs. So let's, yeah, example time. So mosquitoes are going to lay a very large number of eggs and larger eggs are going to survive a little bit better. And more eggs, though, is going to increase the gene flow. So these are this is a trade-off right now about having more eggs versus having bigger eggs. You can optimize this. Technically, you could optimize them both and have the right size of eggs and having the right, you know, more, more eggs increasing gene flow. Okay, so a lot of eggs that might not survive, but the, the strongest survive, the, uh, the ones that are best adapted to their environment survive, that could be... One way of optimizing it. Another would just be the larger eggs will give them a better chance, give them a better competitive edge. They're going to survive better. So these mosquitoes that lay more or fewer eggs are going to be under selection for uh, gene flow versus uh, survivorship. I'm not going to read this as small. Um, oh, it's darters. So yeah, darters producing larger eggs have a lower gene flow, but darters producing more eggs have higher gene flow. So yeah, gene flow is an optima optimality trait too. Having a higher gene flow is going to increase the survivorship, uh, of course. Um, yes, and darter species that produce larger eggs tend to also lay fewer eggs, meaning they're also going to have that. So it's gene flow versus egg size. Okay, clearly. Then you have parental care versus number of offspring. So in this one case, we have the parental care being the size of the egg because it's an allocation of resources towards the uh, embryo. Here we have an allocation of resources post-embryonic stage in the orangutan. So the orangutan is going to be the high end of parental care. And that's going to have a lower number of offspring. Oh, sorry, I'm looking at the graph backwards. It's going to be the higher end of parental care, lower number of offspring. Yes, it does match with the graph. I don't know why I'm looking at that weird. Um, the number of offspring being the x-axis. Maybe because I'm not my flip? Okay. Um, <laughs> anyway, the orangutan has seven years uh, during which it's going to have that one offspring and care for that one offspring, really ensuring its survival pretty much to adulthood, but one offspring. So like not much in the way of uh, orangutan mating. That's one thing that makes them a very slow uh, growth species with a very low R. Then we have things like the, uh, the clutch size here. So you have this robin. One of these robins has produced five eggs. One has produced six. Okay, so the, uh, the robin that produces five eggs can have, again, we're back to the merganser, five bigger eggs versus six smaller eggs. And if you think about this in terms of calcium, you realize that uh, the surface area to volume ratio of six small eggs is greater than the surface area to volume ratio of five small eggs, or five medium eggs, because it's um, a whole other egg, and that's going to be adding its own, um, its own problem. So that's going to be uh, another allocation they have to think about is in terms of calcium. And in terms of uh, how many chicks you can feed, you can put six small eggs is going to require that you feed six small birds until they become six fledgling birds. Whereas five medium eggs are going to require that you feed the five medium birds until they fledge, which is not as long. And then we also look here at this, uh, this plant chart. And I love this plant chart, by the way. And it shows that plants produce larger seeds, produce fewer. And that's just conventional wisdom. Wait, two beats. And it's also not always true. This is one of the things that's making a manuscript that I'm currently working on with, uh, with a student 
is that we found that there are plants within the species producing more eggs, more seeds, and these seeds are all larger. But on a between species basis, generally speaking, the number of seeds goes down as the average seed mass goes up. It's investment. It's investment. And it's things like with, the, with my scotch brew. When I saw that plants that had more, had bigger seeds also had more seeds, that's one of those, hold on, why? Well, it could be that these organisms are investing more in seeds, both in size and number, and less in some other trait, which is then, you know, allocation... When you see allocation isn't true for something, it's probably because it's being allocated away somewhere else. And then you just got to test everything, right? All right, here we have lifespan versus the number of offspring. The, uh, the more offspring that are produced, generally speaking, the shorter the lifespan. So that also has some parental care uh, implications as well. So having a large number of mosquito egg offspring, well, mosquitoes are there for a season and then they're gone. Whereas elephants tend to live for, well, much longer period of time, but they tend to produce fewer offspring. And this has to do as well with how long the offspring take to get to sexual maturity. With eggs, with mosquitoes, it's very fast. With elephants, it's a while. All right, so here we have with different fish, like see that there's uh, adult survival here with the uh, age at maturity. So you have you know lizards and snakes that have higher survival, mature at a later egg or age, or fish with uh, higher mortality rates, reach reproductive maturity at an earlier age. So live fast, die young, right? And then fish with higher mortality rates allocate a greater proportion of their energy to, re to reproduction. Really, die young, live fast, hashtag YOLO. So natural selection will favor different organisms with different strategies in different environments. This only makes sense. If your environment is a is a spring pool that dries up quickly, there really isn't a point in extended parental care. And again, this is optimality based on the environment. If your environment has uh, yearly freezes, but you want to live through them, well, that tells that you probably should finish the offspring care before the freeze comes, or you're going to have to care for the you know, feeding for two during the freezing time. And here we have some different types of... Um, survivorship strategies. The first one would be that opportunistic. So opportunistic, we see um, organisms have a lower fecundity, a smaller age of maturity, and a lower inter uh, juvenile survivorship. So that's kind of the opportunistic side of things, like guppies. Um, well, lower fecundity, well, yes, but they're able to reproduce multiple times. That's good. Uh, low age of maturity, they're able to very quickly mature. So think about that. A guppy can be sexually mature in, I think, like a month. I actually don't know about this, but you check on your own. If it's a month or so, that's pretty fast. That means you have one guppy producing three baby guppies, which can be mature in a month. And then those three baby guppies can produce more guppies, can produce more guppies, and very quickly grow that family. So a juvenile survivorship Yes, it's relatively low, but under conditions where juvenile survivorship can go up even a little, they very quickly mature. And when they very quickly mature, then you're going to get the, high, the fecundity coming up really, really quickly. Being able to mature quickly does also mean a lower overall fecundity because they don't have as many resources that they have grown. Okay, like if you look at this amphibian and reptile, something like an, an owl or a toad is going to be more of that opportunistic. The toad has a high fecundity, but it trades it off with being a little older than the anole as far as how long it takes them to mature. And, of course, it's actually going to have a, a relatively low juvenile survivorship for toads yeah, and anoles, quite honestly. But if conditions allow the toads to all reach maturity, just look at the cane toad in Australia, how fast that population could expand given the right opportunities. Uh, ducks are closer to that opportunistic. Now, they're not as opportunistic as guppies, clearly, but they have a higher age of maturity. So, higher age of maturity than like a guppy, but a higher fecundity as well than a guppy. And that allows them to, if conditions are right and they raise a whole bunch of little ducklings up to adult ducks, very quickly grow in population. Same with something like a deer mouse. You think about how quickly deer mice can thrive. 
when the grain silos are full and not guarded by cats. We then have something like periodic. And that is having the ability to um, have a high fecundity, um, long age of maturity, but very low juvenile survivorship. So it goes on there with this uh, very low juvenile survivorship is occasionally these conditions will be just right. And when they're just right, you can get a large number surviving. If they can, then, well, they have to go all the way to maturity, but if they do, Occasionally, you will get these periods where you have more of the organism or less of the organism, but they're periodic. So occasionally you'll have more and occasionally you'll have, well, less. Um, they wait to, they can be there, they can live long enough, however, that they can wait for the right time. So an ocean sunfish may have many reproductive cycles, most of which are not going to really replace it, but occasionally a lot. Sturgeons can have many reproductive cycles where it's you know, basically just caviar, um, but occasionally those, a lot of them, enough of them will survive. And that's an opportunistic strategy. It's not really something we're familiar with as mammals, because as you see, not much in the way of, of amphibians can have that. Amphibians and reptiles are closest to crocodile. Um, for birds, just no. And for mammals, really no. There are no periodic, uh, there aren't periodic mammals. Then you get what's called the equilibrium species. And those are the ones that are going to be investing more highly in uh, juvenile survivorship. So by investing more highly in juvenile survivorship, like a shark, they have larger offspring, there's less death. It takes a longer time until they're at reproductive maturity, and they will have lower fecundity, but they can exist at the relatively same level in the population, so, or in the, in the environment. So with a guppy, you have these um, really fast increases until they reach carrying capacity then plummets. But with a shark, it's going to be much more um, surviving at this, uh, the same number, the same amount of time, same amount of individuals for a longer amount of time. Not taking advantage in periodic swings, but just staying at, well, equilibrium. Like the desert tortoise, you're going to have relatively the same number of desert tortoises um, over any period of time. Even though they're not going to have a high fecundity, they don't need to, to replace their own population. Same with the boobies and albatrosses, although they're a little younger, and humans and elephants can live at an equilibrium kind of perspective. They have a high juvenile survivorship. Most elephants and most humans do make it to reproductive maturity, be that very late, and they have a lower fecundity because they invest so much in juvenile survivorship. On the extreme side of things, we see the, uh, again, semi-parity versus iteroparity. So semel parity is this once in a lifetime kind of thing and producing many offspring just once. And that's a whole resource investment dump. There's no parental care with semel parity. It's a really fun exam question. Uh, how much parental care with semel parity? Well, the, the parent is dead, unless you're counting eggs, in which case you can see the amount invested in eggs. But semel parity, producing many offspring once, usually at the end of life. Interoparity, though, producing few offspring many times. And you can see the few, the many, the many, the once, that kind of trade-off going on. And which one's optimal? Well, it depends on the organism. It depends on the environment. And that's where it's difficult to really compare two organisms and say, well, a salmon and a mouse, which is better? Well, it really depends. What is their environment? Does it help a salmon to swim upstream, produce medium number of eggs, and then swim back downstream? You know, some salmon do, or did at least. There are some salmon that will swim upstream, deposit eggs, and come back down. They don't deposit as many eggs as uh, one of these salmon that's going to go up one-way ticket, but they can do some more times, but that might be a better option given the environment. So again, evolution will choose between these different things, what is best for that organism, what is available, what available variation exists in the life history, and what is ultimately optimal. So there you have it. Life histories. There are many. We'll cover some more.
in another lecture and we'll get more into plants.